Hello, um, um, I'm very happy to be here and with you all. I was talking to Julia and a few of us in, as participants how I actually don't often get to talk about sustainability and climate issues with largely music and sound community. I'm very happy to be in community to meet you all and, and to do so. It's often um, in collaboration with uh, climate scientists or environmentalists or um, with NGOs. And uh, I'm a contemporary artist, but I've always had um, a passion and a calling for cultural and environmental conservation. And I love to work with traditional artists. I think it's when I was working in the Philippines with seven of, the, um, of our indigenous groups in the North and South. And all the time they came to me about environmental issues and so I'm listening, you know, right? Time to listen and, and how can you not listen to that? And even not knowing what to do at the time um, as a contemporary artist, I, I still thought, okay, I have to listen to this and listen in a larger context and see how I can help support. And I think that also grew out of um, aesthetic of my artistic practice. I've always been very sensitive to being in spa a spatial environment and how sound moves in the space, how we interact in this, both as human beings or in environment with um, nature, with animals and birds. It's been something very sensitive that I wanted to always bring back a kind of meta-nature when I'm in a creative place. And so that also brought me into collaboration with uh, different kinds of scientists and architects. So this piece, I first met this NGO and music program, Judo Sahar, in um, the South Sahara, Morocco, in Mohammed Oasis, which is the last oasis in Morocco, just above Algier. And we were just on field for two weeks. I just got back this last week from um, architect Aziz Shalni, and we were creating, I also, like many of you, create sound walks. We were creating a sound walk for Fez, which tells a story of um, the evolution of urbanization and water in the old city of the Medina of Fez, because it used to be known as the city of a thousand rivers, and then they cemented up many of the ways that the rivers came into the old city. And so this is part of the effort to open it up. And we um, told the story through um, sound and recordings and uh, collaborating with certain traditional artists and Sufi groups in the old Medina and the architectural history, both from the gardens and the buildings. And so in 2016, Aziza came to me and said, I'm also co-founding an NGO and music program in um, the South Sahara and Mohammed El Ghislan, and we're working to help preserve seven of the traditional heritage tribes in the Dra Valley, and also uh, programs to help support uh, women and girls, to help support uh, especially the young girls in, in, um, in their education and in their opportunities um, in the South Sahara, in North Africa, and in, in this particular region with Halim Sabai, who is a um, cultural advocate and um, many things, uh, also the founder of Judah Sahar and from the desert, uh, Thomas Duncan, who is uh, director of programs for the NGO Playing for Change, which helped found Judah Sahar and uh, Sahara Roots, which is, is um, one of the founders for which they're building the school and focuses on planting trees and anti-desertification in the Sahara, which is a, a certain process of planting the trees with these boxes so that it increases from about 20 to 80 percent their chance to survive in the desert. Because there's certain, certain trees that will really take root. As you can see here, um, these trees here are, um, that are uh, endemic to the area are the date palms. And they've been drying up from the extreme heat 
so I, um, I met with them and I, I started at the time also to send students down to help um, support as they were growing their music program. And we started to become involved in a few different projects in which I'm also helping to record a lot of the artists in the area. And, um, and this particular project, which we've titled, it's still in early field, is uh, Stories of the Desert in a Changing Climate. And this is where we are recording. They chose it. It's always um, grounded in asking the youth and the community, you know, what story, what, what is their voice, and what would they like to tell. A story of extreme heat here in the desert. You're seeing the Sahara Desert. This is just outside Zahwi, which is the cultural center they're building, the music schools. It's just right next door to the farm, which I'll show you in a second. And they wanted to tell a story of water in the desert. And I said, OK. Um, Water has been something in, in so much of um, my work, very important. I've, I've often been called to collaborate to tell a story of water, whether it's a film score or it's um, literally I'm mapping with hydrophones, rhythms off of uh, glacier runoff and stuff on, on another with, um, project, water rhythms. But that is a whole different kind of sensitivity that um, here, where it's like extreme lack of water, extreme heat, uh, the desert pushing up, desertification, which is um, changing all the farms, even in the last 40 years. Um, unsustainable farming, where some areas there, so in this area, you, you cannot plant watermel watermelons, because this kind of fruit there will just dry up. The, and, um, the soil. So that's not something that's um, native to the area that works well. And so with the girls, we are, they're 8 to 15 years old, and we are recording in the area um, the sounds of the water and even tracing the roots of, in the Dra Valley, the river, which the riverbed is completely dried up, but we're recording the sounds as well as certain reservoirs, and then uh, nomad wells, and also the sounds of what's important to them for their stories about water is um, a lot in the home, like, like something I would take for granted. The, the faucet is really an important source for them, and they have water rationing, so certain times of day you don't have water. But what's really incredible is this is a type of water crisis that's happening in the Sahara. And they're so resourceful, uh, which it says a lot. Because when I'm down there, I never feel as if I don't have water. I never feel that. The way that they manage it, uh, it's pretty incredible. But it's, it is hurting um, their farming and their livelihood. OK. So that's a picture outside of Zawiya in Mohammed, right outside their farm. Here we are walking through. This is if you come just in, and these are some of the girls, and they're um, recording with me. And this is Habib. Habib is a master farmer, and he runs the Zudra Sahara farm. So they're starting up the water pump, that, and um, they were recording this. Let me see one second.
This is the water reservoir that they're building on site. So in, there's six oases in Morocco. Mohammed is the last one. So this is the most south. And uh, this is a small one that they're building specifically on the music school site, which, um, which is pretty much done. When, when uh, they were in this photo, they were still building it. Uh, and this is a mixed-use building because it has the reservoir, and there's several levels. There's also going to be a classroom in there. Um, so one of, the, one of the sounds that we recorded as we were looking for um, sounds to record the water, about 40 minutes south of Judah Sahara in the Sahara Desert, there's a solar-powered um, drinking well where uh, camels are brought to drink. And th at this time, this was in May, it's really quite hot, so you have to go there at 12 noon <laughs> to find the camels, but there's about 200 camels that are drinking, and they go out there, the nomads who, who um, own the bunches, of the, they let their camels go and they know they're gonna come back to the watering place. And let's see. This is a picture of one of the trees that grows really well in the Sahara. It's called a tamarisk tree, and it has these very strong roots so that it can catch in sand. And what happens when you see, like, because there's sandstorms, what I'm learning as I am continually there, year round there's sandstorms, and they form these kinds of mounds. So they're able to survive and dig their roots in. And often you might see, if you all have seen bivouacs, which are the, the tent communities, so they can build their tent communities around these because they have, they have these kind of dunes that form. But uh, some of them grow, I think I might have another photo in here, grow quite large. I just, I just thought that this particular mound was amazing, I mean, to see how it was grown. Okay, so I think this was last week we went out. That's a tamarisk tree, actually. It can get quite large. Um, so we went out to record a nomad well, which is, was also about, I don't know, maybe 50 minutes away from, from um, Judah Sahar. And a lot, what I find, of recording water in the Moroccan desert is a lot about the silence. And here was the echoes, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot about the absence and um, a different kind of listening that you might be in another environment where it's an, not just an abundance, it's too much, right? And you have flooding or something. And um, this student, she's such a talented musician and also field recorders, Arwa, I think she's 12. Uh, we asked her, she's singing one of their um, traditional Emisier songs that you will hear many, many groups sing this song, and she's singing it into the well. Let's see. Oh, sorry. I can't. Hmm. Sorry. I'm waiting for this, this to come up. 
Sorry. It's not coming up the same way as, uh, is it? Usually it would be right here for the others. Do I press it elsewhere? Um, yeah, there is it. Ah, oh, it's so tiny. Okay. So we started them first on these very small H1 zooms because some of them are you know, eight years old, what they can hold and manage. And then we also have them on um, larger zooms and sound devices mixed pre. We have different things in here. We also have the hydrophones going down into the well. And I didn't pull this up, but they also did the whole sound of the buckets and, and, and all of that. Um, yeah, so that's basically the work in progress. They also have been doing interviews of people in the community. So we're interviewing both their family members, residents, nomads, heritage tribes, farmers, uh, to hear how they've been affected by the climate um, and how has it changed and um, you know, what are they doing today. So I'd just like to open up the floor for any questions. I'm, I'm curious about the, the, um, I'm curious about the, um, the collaboration that you had with the, with the scientists or the environmental maybe activists there and mostly in terms of farming there because they have a, a kind of a sustainable farm, farming uh, a tradition or a culture, but these places have been affected because of a very unsustainable farming, uh, or at least as one of the things, or in other places. And what do they think about uh, about this, or what do you have to tell us? Um, well, it's, it's terrible. I mean, it's definitely a water crisis. So the unsustainable farming of with like watermelon, which is not compatible to not just here in Mohammed, but even if you go up to the Anti Atlas and towards the Atlas Mountains, more mid region, um, it, it dries out the land. And then you can't actually farm on top of that again. So that's what's happening. You know, it's not like, oh, okay, we can clear it and then we can farm again. So it's really terrible. And I mean, it's going on. You see it in the markets, they're selling the melons. <laughs> so my friend and collaborator, Halim Sabai, is definitely. <laughs> anti-watermelon for the area because it's, it's it's not sustainable, right? And the, um, the anti-desertification uh, efforts are with the sand encroaching. So I didn't show a picture. I can show you later. There's a certain kind of weaving, hatching that you can place in the desert that they have this. It moves like little, like weaving and to, to hold off the sand, and then also planting the trees. So to plant these trees with this kind of box method so that it's definitely, they say it's moved from like 20 to 80% now that are surviving, because a tree to survive in the desert 
I mean, when we went through an acacia, a, a acacia forest, you can see some of it back here, to get to this nomad, um, well, I guess it's not really a forest, it's the desert, but it's the acacia tree park. And I was just surprised how different they are. So for example, in the Philippines, acacia trees are huge. And these, I, I, I have to ask, they're probably from the desert. They, they don't grow as large. I mean, for them it's large, but I've, I've seen them in different species where they're, they're massive. Um, and then it, to interview the farmers, that's very interesting. I mean, it, it's, but it's difficult. It's a difficult situation. I mean, here in Judu Sahar, they have the water pumps, they have the support, they're building the reservoir, but they've just continually had the lands been drying up because of the anti-desertification, because of the, um, the heat increase in temperature and the lack of water. There are some reservoirs that are being built because what happens is when rain comes, they don't have um, they don't have methods, like sustainable methods to store it. But if some of them, and the earlier, the higher up oasis, if they're stored there and they stop before they come here, that's even worse for them. So that's another thing that they're addressing at the moment to be able to build that actually for the Mohammed area. Yes, Carla. Hmm. And would you name it this, uh, what you are doing is your art, or let's say? Oh, uh, that's a great a question. level of transporting this experience into artwork? Yes, right now we're on the field, and I feel very grateful that I have a, um, a long time to be on the field, because also it's youth I'm working with, so I know that some of the, these field trips, we may not, get, we're still, it's a community work, but they're creating a serious art piece with me. It will go up, we will have it as exhibited, we will tour it. And that's something actually I love to do in community. I think, I don't know how it is here in Berlin, so you all could tell me, but often there's a separation of what people think community art and and other art, serious art, right? I, I feel like, I mean, they are smart people. They can learn it. So part of this, sometimes they may not get it, listening back to the recordings, but I really want their, um, their sound samples in the composition, too. I, mean, I certainly could go and record everything myself if I wanted to, but I, I, I don't. You know, I really want to hear what they have to say, what they hear. It's so beautiful to see them just uh, own the practice, right? To, to, to learn and understand our artistic practice and, um, in, and what they hear in the environment. Great question. Like, do, maybe, did you hear it, the question? Did you, okay, how, okay, how much framework did I have and how did I introduce this? So, so uh, Judith Sahar is kind of, and Playing for Change is kind of what you hope for in NGOs. They really, a lot of people, you know, just quietly doing amazing work and uh, supporting community and letting the community lead and tell us what, what they really, what are the needs. Um, so there were meetings first and also, um, they're not seen in this particular photos, but the, I also, I specifically requested for the young girls in the group, because often in the South Sahara and North Africa, the young girls might be just standing around watching some of the young boys doing certain practices. And I also specifically requested the women on staff at the program to help to, um, bring their voice in and to help um, in the recording groups because I'm not there every day so when they have certain projects they can do as they learn how to do that. that um, like, so we had to have some meetings first and, and then they even went on their first field recordings before I came out and 
just tested it out. It was, it was great. I sent, we sent certain recording gear. Um, and then they're also learning how to, how to video and stuff. So they're, they're pretty much taking control. <laughs> Yeah, they love to listen, and they, you know, they. We wanted them to have, have the um, instruments so that they could record any time. And, and another beautiful thing is they're also learning. If you see, saw some of the video, they're learning how to nurture their farm at their school. It's very much like taking care. You know, a frog came out of the water pump area, and they, you know, this is a desert. They flipped out. <laughs> You know, this over this frog, and it was great. But yeah, they they are listeners. Um, the morning in that space is amazing for birds. Really amazing. Yes. And uh, um, then you have the community works, and you also went to Nepal and to other regions and uh, worked there, and then. Uh, but at some point, there is a artistic work yeah. then that you uh, present in the so-called maybe Western context. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, one is, do you also present the final result in the p places where the project has been uh, developed? And the second is, uh, um, is there a shift of intention um, between the, what you do in the community work to the intention of the final work when you present it in the Western context? And what might the intention be? That's many questions, <laughs> but great. Um, it's like tributaries. I think that one doesn't have to exist without the other, and other things can pop up. You know, and just to allow it to to exist, uh, because certainly the communication of it changes, right? When it goes into different communities and goes into different spaces, um, and also still in the development of a music sound or artwork, you still have that integrity. You want it to be as great as it can be. And so I feel fortunate in the fact that this is a piece with the youth, that we have time for them to practice that. And I think they, they will get it. A few things are already in there. Some things have to go back and be recorded again. But I think that's also great that, I mean, the whole process with the, with the result. Um, it does, I mean, I think like many things, I mean, you write a piece of work, a composition, perform something that goes out into the public, and then it has its own life of its own, right? It meets new people, and it starts to have another relationship in the public and connect to a lot more stories. So th these kinds of works also do. And yes, actually, to exhibit in the space, we are um, discussing how it will tour in Morocco both in um, Sagora, which is the next big town about two hours from Mohammed, and in uh, Rabat, Casa, Blanca, and uh, Fez. So it will t this piece will also tour at home. Thank you.